Okay, so, welcome to video part two, I suppose. It is, uh, late at night. Uh, let's see if I can make it throughout this entire presentation without cursing. All right, here we go. So the high Middle Ages. So we made it through the early Middle Ages, uh, leading up to the beginning, uh, or the, uh, the Vikings. Um, this time period is what happens after the Vikings kind of go away, which is kind of what happens with the Vikings. They just sort of go away. A lot of reasons for that. One reason um, that a lot of historians tend to believe is that the Ice Age rescinded. So like the Ice Age ended and so they were able to farm. So they stopped killing people. Uh, another uh, popular theory is that they started to kidnap more and more people from mainland Europe, including uh, Catholic priests, and they became uh, Catholic and then they stopped killing people. Take your pick. You could probably say both. Some some amalgamation of both. All right. So today, High Middle Ages. What happens after the Vikings go away? Starting in 1066, uh, we begin, of course, with a little uh, review. God, I hate PowerPoint so much. I hate you, PowerPoint. Why are you a laser pointer? Anyways. All right. Uh, so here we go. Okay, so we're going to start off with a review from video series one, and your review deals with these two things. Remember this? This song and this tapestry, uh, this is where our review questions are going to come from. Answer those questions now. All right, so we've answered our review questions, and now we are ready to move on. Let's get going. For two minutes in, I hate this so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. So um, for this activity, I'm going to put it up on Nearpod. I'm going to give that a shot. And so you are going to be kind of duly responsible here in the sense that you are going to be responsible for taking notes on Google Notes so that you can take those notes and use them on uh, quizzes or tests or final exams, should we prove to have one. Uh, final exam, that is. Uh, and you'll also be asked to participate with the questions that pop up in the Nearpod. So think of yourselves uh, as answering questions in two places. So for this question, what I'll need is I'll need you to answer it in your notes. Uh, so question number one, would you rather be born rich but dumb or poor but brilliant? So I need you to answer that question. You might be thinking like, this doesn't seem like it makes any sense, but it will, you'll see. Uh, so answer the question and then put that in your notes should be the first thing that we see. Uh, just like in the last set of notes, the first thing we saw was the green sleeves. First thing we're going to see here is the answer to that question. Would you rather be rich but dumb or poor and brilliant? Uh, second question. Uh, this is largely you're just guessing, uh, unless you know, I don't, couldn't imagine that you would, but of the people who are born poor in the United States, what percentage of them are able to move up to middle class? So uh, what percentage of people who are born poor make their way up to middle class? Give me the percentage that you think that is present day in the United States right now. And then um, just, I originally thought that maybe you guys could do this in groups, but that'd be dumb. Like who wants to take notes as a group and watch a video? It seems stupid. Anyways, uh, why did you come up with this number? So give me some rationale for why you think it is the way that it is. Fair enough. Moving on. Now we're here we go. All right. So the Vikings go away. They literally just go away. And so Europe is largely left in, a, in quite a bit of chaos. Okay. And so the question becomes, what brings Europe back together? And you can see it if you've ever been to Europe. Uh, it becomes obvious what brings the what brings uh, Europe back together because all of their major cities are founded around them. This is the this is Notre Dame in Paris. This looks like Edinburgh. So some of these are my pictures. Uh, Europe rebuilds itself around the church, the Catholic Church, and so uh, you, you see this rise of the Catholic Church. The the church starts to build in rural areas. The rural areas become popular, and that is where we start to see the formation of the cities that we've come to know in Europe. This is the Paris, Berlin, that sort of situation. Uh, so the church becomes a unifying um, center and it, what brings Europe together. So not only does it bring it together, it also begins trade. 
the Catholic Church uh, begins the system of unification. And so like prior to this, remember, we talked about under the clan system with Vikings or like if you went to a different area, you didn't know. You didn't know the laws because no one wrote anything down. So if you went to someplace else and they had a different set of customs, you might just get yourself killed. Uh, see, originally we were going to post an article about a body to which was discovered that the lips and nose had been cut off uh, in Europe. This is why. So the Catholic Church provides a unifying set of spiritual beliefs, rituals, and laws. So it creates a system of justice. So we remember we talked about unwritten laws during the during the early Middle Ages. In the middle in the high Middle Ages you have laws that are they're based on the Catholic faith. They're called canon law. So it's the law of the church. So this allows for the church to become incredibly powerful. So the church, there is no separation of church and state here. Um, it's sort of an intermingling, sort of, they call it the two sword analogy. So on one sword, you have the church and on the other sword, you have, um, you have like kings and queens and uh, dukes and earls and all that stuff. And they were, they were supposed to have equal power between the two. So the Catholic church didn't have an army. I mean, well, they did, but they didn't officially have an army. Um, how they ruled and how they held uh, sway was with canon law and with things like excommunication. So excommunication is where you're literally kicked out of the religion. So uh, in a society to which is you almost all Catholic, um, early Christian, uh, if you got kicked out of the religion, that's a very big deal. You can't own property. Um, largely, you're probably going to be executed, but, but being excommunicated from the church is a huge threat. And so the church now begins to make itself a very powerful player in the, in the high middle ages. So not only did they have excommunication, they had interdiction. Interdiction is the denial of sacrament. Um, so in the Catholic faith, you have to go through these sacraments in order to reach heaven. The last one being last rites. Uh, if you uh, didn't tithe, which means you didn't donate to the church, or maybe you just were pissing the church off, they could uh, enact interdiction. So essentially it was to deny you sacraments. So if you were dying, they would deny you last rites, which means you couldn't go to heaven. They could also do that to anyone in your family going all the way back. Literally, the Catholic church was pulling people out of heaven interdiction. So if you were doing something and you were screwing up and you were pissing the church off enough, they could quite literally tell you that by it, the power of interdiction, they were going to remove your family members. Your, let's say your dead grandfather. They were going to remove that person out of heaven because they had the power to do so. That's a lot of power uh, for the middle ages. So the, the Catholic church, one sword of the two sword analogy. All right, so we've come to our second art piece. This is Hortus Delacron. This is um, the Garden of Earthly Delights. And so what this particular painting does is it shows us uh, how the Middle Ages saw, saw power and how art was sort of displayed. So you have in this the power of the Middle Ages. Now, uh, you have sort of your king here, but e but just to the right, of the, or just well, to the right of the king, you have the church. So the church takes up a system of power and a position of power. And on the other side, you have the wealthy. So what you have is the formation of what we have come to think of as the high middle ages, that sort of knights and dukes and earls and all that nonsense. Um, this you can kind of see it form here. You have, uh, this is like the market class or like merchant class. So people who sell goods and trade goods and the peasants. And so you have here in represented in a form of art, you have um, the Middle Ages, the, the high Middle Ages. Uh, not only that, you have this sort of, and you'll see this only really in Middle Ages art. In It becomes much different in the Renaissance, but like, there's not enough time. We're not even going to cover the Renaissance. But um, in this kind of art, you have a separation of heaven and earth. So the roof of the, I don't know, building, I suppose, creates a barrier between the warring factions of angels and demons separation of heaven and earth and then so it is it's a sort of weird system right but like essentially it is the idea of you have the king in heaven but now you also need to recognize the kings on earth uh, it is this thing called divine right essentially the kings in this era take on this position that they are made rich and they are made kings because 
God favors them. Divine right. So that's why. All right, let's move on. Uh, already covered this, not going over it. So we get to the crux of the matter, feudalism. So today we're going to talk about feudalism. It's sort of the main uh thing we're going to talk about uh it is like a chess set so like it is a system a hierarchy or system of society uh top down so it plays out exactly like a chess board if you've played chess then you know how the what are the most powerful pieces and that's exactly what happens in feudalism so this is what is called a system of reciprocity um a system of payback the system is supposed to work because everybody gives gives up something and everybody gets something. So, at the top, you have the king. Uh, underneath the king, you have vassals. Vassals are like lords and ladies and dukes and earls, this sort of ruling, largely rich class of people. Um, they are given, or they are the second tier. Then underneath that, you have knights. We'll talk about knights on Monday. It's not what you think. Just so, let me just... Let me dispel any myth you might have concerning what knights were. Um, no. <laughs> like, laughably no. And then on the bottom you have the serfs. Uh, serfs are the peasant class. So, if it's a system of reciprocity, everybody gives something and everybody gets something. So, let's take a look at what that looks like. So, kings are kings because they have a ton of land. Oh, there it is there. Uh, reciprocity or mutual obligation. Kings are kings because they're rich. That's pretty much it. Um, there is this, like, desire to think of them as being, like, something that they're simply not. Kings were just rich people who had more wealth than anyone else, and that's how they that's how they were made king. They didn't do anything special, no sword out of a stone. Um, they were rich. So kings have land, and so that is how you gain wealth in the high middle ages, that's how you gain wealth now. And so what would happen is kings would give part of their land, uh, they called them fiefs, sometimes fiefs, you can call it either one, I don't care, uh, fiefs to vassals. So uh, you would give land, swaths of land to the people who also who were rich, who you trusted, essentially. That would be your dukes and earls and all that kind of stuff. So they are given land grants, large pieces of land that they are to farm on, really. So knights then go, or sorry, then vassals give to the knights and they also, they take the big piece of land the king gave them and they cut it up into smaller pieces and they give those to knights. Now knights are there to offer protection. So uh, the knights are supposed to protect the serfs who live there and the serfs, all they have to do is work day and night earning um, or growing food uh, and sustaining life. So they work all the time, every day, um, there's no such thing as childhood and serfdom. Uh, childhood is, we're still quite a ways off from any of that kind of stuff. So the knights are supposed to give uh, protection to the serfs, right? So there you go. Uh, this is, by the way, is an incredibly violent time in human history, in European history especially, largely because the king had a problem. Uh, these vassals also want to be king, and so what the king typically does is he makes sure that the vassals are always fighting. Or this king goes off and goes and fights someplace else, uh, the Crusades, to which um, you were supposed to have covered in the sixth grade, but I'm guessing you didn't. Uh, but the kings would often leave Europe to go fight in other places, So all, sometimes other places in Europe, sometimes places uh, like Jerusalem and the Crusades to uh, take over Jerusalem. All right, so here we go. So this is what all of these groups give, but what do they get in return? What is, what's the give back? What's the reciprocity? So serfs, like I talked about, serfs offer service, work. They they make stuff, food typically, but they make stuff, right? Uh, serfs' first obligation is so like if you're a farmer, your first obligation is to give to the knights and you have to give them uh, enough for them to sustain life and then they also have to pass that up so um serfs paid themselves last that's why like if you go back to that picture uh, it's why they look like they're starving it's because they were probably starving um europe had not developed like free field systems or like high uh advanced farming techniques not that they existed certainly in other places in the world but not in europe yet and so farming was hard and it wasn't yielding a ton of stuff and so the serfs were sickly and starving so they had to give food 
to the knights. Now, the knights, what do they give to the vassals? Well, since the vassals are always fighting, the knight's responsibility is to fight on behalf of the vassals. I, you're going to hear my dog snoring in just a second because it's like, I don't know, two in the morning, maybe three. I was going to do this in the early morning, but then I decided like, I don't know what I decided. All right. So what do the knights offer? Military protection. When the vassals go off to war, what happens is these knights round up a bunch of serfs to fight in wars on behalf of the vassals. The, the knights, uh, we'll talk about them later, but those are the guys in shining armor or whatever. Serfs are farmers. They're just a bunch of farmers. So if the vassal goes off to war, they go, hey, knights, we're going to war. Good luck. Uh, go get all of your serfs. So literally all of your male serfs starting at about the age of 12 uh, up to about, well, how, how old do serfs really live? Let's say 30. 40. Uh, they are then brought into the army. And so when these guys go off to war, the knights grab a bunch of serfs and they go off with the vassals. Now, what do the vassals give the king? You're probably going to guess correctly. Yeah, it's, it's when the king goes off to war, then the vassals get the knights, the knights get the serfs, and they all go off to war. Also, going up this chain but not talked about, rarely, is all the food that the serfs are making. 100% of the food that is eaten at this time is all provided by the serfs. The serfs have to make, provide enough food to not just give to food to the knights, but also to make sure the knights have food to give to the vassals, to make sure the, the vassals have food to give to the king. You can kind of see where we're going here. So if this system is about payback and reciprocity and it's all fair, can you see the gigantic gaping hole in this system that makes it unfair? This is your question. Answer it now on Nearpod, but also please in your notes. Okay, so I'm interested to hear what you said, but did anyone else notice that the serfs get nothing? The serfs are supposed to be protected by these knights, right? The problem is anytime any of these guys go off to war, they just grab a bunch of serfs and the serfs are not military trained. They're farmers. So when the knights go off to war, they grab a bunch of serfs. The serfs are going to be get a sword put in their hand and then be told to go off and fight. They are not trained to fight. Knights, as we'll talk about on Monday, are trained from age seven to fight in these glorious battles of war and poetry. Serfs are just farmers. They get nothing out of this system. And I mean truly nothing. And you could see it on that picture where they're starving to death. Uh, that is the life of a serf. So, is feudalism fair? Like, no, obviously, right? So, lords divide their states. I don't know why we're going over this again. Is this a stupid picture from your textbook? What a garbage clip art picture this piece of junk is. This is why I shouldn't be doing this kind of stuff at like 2 and 3 in the morning. I almost swore. But I didn't. Tell your parents. Or actually, don't tell your parents. All right, so... Feudalism, we talked about it. Um, it is on one side of it. It is land breakup. And then coming back, it is food and protection. So there we go. All right, let's get going. Fiefdoms, we're good. Nobles, vassals, peasants, and serfs. Do we need to cover any of this? Nope, 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 nope. Um, no, I don't think we need to cover any of this stuff. This seems like it's pretty obvious serfdom stuff, right? Uh, as you could imagine, life as a serf, not fun, uh, and highly controlled. So, um, the, so now we have a different set of laws. So you have, you have canon law, which covers everybody. No one can break canon law, but you now have separate laws to which Kings begin to write. Um, and those laws are, they're not canon law and they're certainly not fair. And so, you know, you need to have these serfs stay on this property. And so you get indebted serfdom. It's a form of largely slavery. If we're going to call it what it is, they're not allowed to leave. They don't own their own land. Um, they don't own their own food. It's not a great life. Uh, it does sort of yield itself towards the plague, which is coming, but not yet there. All right. So there we go. Serfdom pretty awful as one could imagine. Uh, life of a serf, harsh work, long armors. I mean, you, yeah, whatever. A uh, few live past 35. Eh, okay, hold on. So, like, we'll talk about this on Monday. There's a reason why it says that they don't live past 35. It's because you have to sort of average out 
there's an incredibly high infant mortality rate, but we'll talk about that on Monday. But obviously you can figure out, like, given the fact that they lived in squalor, didn't eat much, and then also had to fight in these guys' wars, they didn't live to be very long. All right, let's see here. Da, 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 da. This all seems... Oh, no, I do have to talk about this. Okay, so we talked about sort of the harshness of manor life. Manor are these fiefdoms, right? So you'd call them a manor. Um, everybody pays taxes up. They call them tithes. So you have to tithe twice. One tithe is to the church, and the church always gets their money. If you can't pay money, then you have to pay in food, and that's serfdom as well. So you have to pay a tithe to both the church, and it's a church tax, and you also just had to pay straight up taxes to the knights and taxes to the vassals and, va and taxes to the king. So it is a system of money that only goes up. And so these kings typically use their money to try to expand their kingdom. And the only way you can expand your kingdom, the only way you can get richer is through war, which is why the vassals are always fighting. And to be honest, that's kind of what the kings want. Kings don't want a vassal like they, they don't want the vassals. Um, eventually a vassal will decide to take on a king. That's how, that's how it all transfers. Right. And so it's to your benefit as the king to always have your vassals fighting. Okay. So taxes go to vassals and kings and then tithing goes to the church. And before, so if you're making, if you're growing potatoes or whatever, before you eat a potato, you are paying it to the church. You're literally giving them money or giving them food. And you're also paying the knights and kings and queens and vassals and all that kind of stuff. Tithing and taxing. All right. Ah, boring, 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 boring. Why am I repeating everything so many times? I don't know why. Don't feel like I need to. Oh my God, I'm nearly done. 22 minutes. Amazing. All right. So, uh, this is not a time period to where people traveled very much. And so if you were a serf, you probably lived your entire life in the same 15 mile radius. Unless you went off to war, then you went someplace else. But as we'll talk about on Monday, you probably died at that war. You'll see why. It's worse than you think. Um, but it's a very insular life. If you were a knight or if you were a, a serf, you you lived and died within a very small radius unless you went off to war and then you probably went off in war and died. Um, knights were like rich kids. So they got sent off to all different places, including what will go on to be called college. So uh, it's not a time period where there's a lot of travel for serfdom. There is travel for um for knights and vassals and for merchant trade so merchant trade returns all right feels like again note to self try not to do this at two o'clock in the morning also i don't know why that i it feels like i've repeated myself 140 times um kind of always saying the same thing which is annoying to me and i imagine annoying to you too all right um, so castles and keeps, this is a castle thing. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on it really tr like quite honestly. Um, probably cause you guys think you know about it and I'll talk about it on Monday and you know, you, but you know, you probably don't. But so because you have a system where all the money keeps going up and up and up and up and up, they have to find ways to spend this money. And that's why castles are essentially built. Castles exist because they have, because knights and vassals have surplus money. Everybody is paying them. And so their expenditures are largely used for like vanity projects. And that becomes castles. So that is why castles exist. Uh, castles exist because there's a surplus amount of money for vassals and kings. What else are they going to spend it on if not, you know, buildings to sort of show how rich they are? So we'll talk about castles. Uh, eh, oh, these are my pictures. So, um, wait, are these my yeah, these are my pictures. Uh, let's see what else. Anything else of import? My pictures, my pictures, my pictures. Oh, this is a nightmare. This is Germany here. So, so on a tour in Germany, and like we were walking on this path, and they 
pointed at what this is and they're like hey do you guys want to go over there of course they were speaking german so i have no idea what they were saying uh and i foolishly was like yeah sure and so i end up uh we had to walk over a bridge to get to this castle to see this nonsense and like i don't speak german and so i'm at one side of the bridge and this the tour guide is screaming his head off at me and i'm like i don't i don't speak german and so he runs at me, waving his hands like this, and he starts speaking in German. And I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know. And he just goes, how? I'm like, what? How? And then somebody on the other side of the bridge is like, he says you're too fat to walk on the bridge. That was Germany. All right. So I think that feels like a good place. No, here's a good place to end. Um, so some questions about upward mobility. Um, I would imagine that many of you said that you would rather be poor and brilliant. And so you tend to judge a society by its lowest, how it treats its lowest group, right? Uh, it's this, um, a number of different philosophers, but we're going to talk about a guy named Locke here in a second. But, uh, most people would say, Hey, I'd rather be poor and brilliant because... I would just use my brilliance to become rich. Well, here's the thing. In America, most people who are born, born poor die poor. Only about 7% make it out of poverty. So, interesting, interesting, right? So these systems of hierarchy kind of always exist. You have to kind of take yourself out of it to be able to see it. Um, this is where we'll end. We're going to talk about uh, systems of hierarchy on Monday. And that is that. I don't want to talk about any of this stuff. We'll talk about Machiavelli later. He was fun too. All right. Uh, 27 minutes, not completely terrible. I hope you learned something about feudalism. Uh, just be able to recite the uh, layers of feudalism and then what each one gave to each other. It's kind of the big one on that. All right. That was video lecture number two. I will see everybody on Monday. Um, reminder for Monday, some things I need you to think about are what are the rules for dating in 2020? And that ends it. Good night, everyone. I will see you all on Monday. Uh, that's all I got.